Tonight on Catalyst, fighting fire with fire. To burn or not to burn? Actually, that's not the question. Knowing the enemy... To find out how fire works, we put a bushfire in a box. And decisions under fire. When this forest burnt, firefighters had to make some quick decisions. A special edition of Catalyst, in the line of fire. Mogs Creek on Victoria's Great Ocean Road. A picturesque and peaceful scene today, but when violent fires cut through this ridge in 1983, only one house was left standing. G'day, welcome to a special edition of Catalyst. With the climate in southern Australia warming up and drying out, the years ahead are set to bring fires even worse than those that ripped through here on Ash Wednesday. In fact, even more severe than the fires we saw elsewhere in Victoria on February 7 on Black Saturday. But what about the long-term history of fire in Australia? What part has climate played and what part humans? Well, Paul Willis decided to take a cool scientific look into the heated debate over prescribed burning. Does it save property and lives or does it just destroy ecosystems? Bushfires can bring devastation. And they also bring new life. It's widely understood that fire is a natural part of the Australian environment. But what is a natural fire regime for bushland like this? And what role will people have to play in the future burning of Australia? It's time to take a look at the science behind the puff and bluster. Scott Mooney has been looking at charcoal trapped in lake and swamp sediments. A record of burning in Australia stretching back more than 40,000 years. We discovered that there's a whole lot of history, prehistory if you like, that we only imagine. It's commonly thought that the greatest influence on fire regimes is Aboriginal firestick farming. While that may be true for more recent times, Scott's research indicates a much more complex story. There's very little association between the archaeological record and the fire record. So the, the last glacial maximum is about 20,000 years ago. We Over the last 15,000 years, fires have become more frequent as the vegetation recovered from the last ice age. I believe that the dominant signal in this record is a climatic signal. The vegetation responds to changes in climate, and the climate sets the conditions for fire. It doesn't matter which way the change is, whether it's wetter or drier or hotter or colder, the change itself seems to drive fire in our landscape. Chris Lucas has been looking into future changes in climate. Climate and weather are the main drivers of bushfire risk. Everything else follows from the weather and the climate. And the hot topic at the moment is the effects of the Indian Ocean dipole. In the negative phase, there's cool water in the Indian Ocean and warm water off the coast of Australia, bringing rain. In the positive phase, it's the opposite, bringing drought to southern Australia. The positive dipole, which is the bad one for causing drought in, in southern Australia, tends to occur with an El Nino uh, quite often. El Nino also brings dry weather, and in recent years, this double whammy has been occurring more frequently creating ideal bushfire conditions. We are starting to see the effects of climate change. Extreme days are occurring more frequently. Based on current climate trends, we can expect a 10% increase in fire danger days by 2020 and up to a 40% increase by 2050. So what's to be done? We can't control the weather or the climate. The only lever we really do have is, is fuel. So it would seem some sort of burning will be necessary. We want to see fuel reduction. We don't really care how it happens. We can't denude the vegetation to the extent that we're not going to have fires. I think we've got to put 100% of our emphasis on protecting and saving lives in the future. 
in the aftermath of Black Saturday, a lot of people had strong opinions about bushfires. Their fire plans are really hopeless. What effects does it have on biodiversity? Seems like everyone's got an opinion, and the debate is polarised between those who don't want to burn anything and those who want to burn everything. But where's the science? I think we've got to start from the point that these forests are supremely well adapted to fire. Professor Mark Adams has been studying the vulnerability of different forest types to fire. If a mountain ash forest were to be burnt in a bushfire twice in reasonably short succession, we could well lose it. And so that's one of the reasons why we don't uh, advocate the use of prescribed fire in mountain ash forests. But in the other forests, in Victoria, we've got more than 3 million hectares of foothill forest where we can use prescribed fire on a regular basis. And after only seven months since Black Saturday, the foothill forests are showing signs of life. An example of areas of forest that we can still use fire in very safely, but we're getting up towards the limit. Uh, these forests produce uh, seven tonnes of fuel a year quite easily and, as you can see, recovers superbly well after fire. But how often should a forest burn? No one from a scientific point of view is advocating a scorched earth policy of burning every year. On the basis of the data, it means something of the order of five-year return periods for fire. Forest ecologists Patrick Baker and Rowan Simpkins' field site is right next to Marysville, the epicentre of destruction for the Black Saturday fires. You can see there, this 2009 fire got into the forest back here. How these forests respond to fire is part of their study. You have this very, very uh, heterogeneous landscape in terms of the, the response to the fire. Mm. Burnt some places, didn't burn in other places. And along these streams, you have a lot of these trees seem to have survived. It's all about working out how frequently a particular forest would naturally burn or if it should be burnt at all. Different vegetation types have different fire intervals, so different vegetations burn more often and others burn less often. It's this variability between vegetation types that makes fire management so tricky. And although Patrick doesn't agree that there should be a blanket rule to control burn, he is realistic. The forests now are not in an ecological bubble. There are people who live in the forests. Your fuel reduction burns may have to be more aggressive in order to try and minimise the risk, realising that it's not possible, I don't think, to eliminate the risk. You have to remember there's a huge, huge pool of fuel in the forest that is not being reduced, and that's what's up uh, in the crowns of the trees. And if you get fire into that, when you have the extreme weather conditions that we had this year, all of the fuel reduction burning in the world will do nothing. And Patrick understands those risks. We're living here in Selby where we have a wooden house and we've got lots of trees around us and we have five kids. We have no illusions that we would stay and protect this house in any way, shape or form. The forest ecologists might disagree about the frequency with which certain types of forest can be burnt. But they do agree that controlled burning should take place where appropriate. They also agree that no amount of hazard reduction burning would have prevented Black Saturday. That day, in excess of 100 kilometre an hour winds, temperatures in excess of 45 degrees, there was no way that we were going to stop that bushfire just because we had some prescribed burning. As we saw this year in 2009, you'll have fire moving through large areas and with extraordinary force because you have a huge amount of energy and biomass in the crowns of those trees. It's those fires that are so dangerous. This lighthouse cottage at Split Point in Aries Inlet survived the Ash Wednesday fires that raged all around here. It was partly due to a fluke of the elements, but also good fire management. Now, after a big bushfire, teams of scientists are quickly on the ground trying to work out just what happened. So, why are bushfires so destructive? And how can we engineer our homes to increase the chances of survival? Well, Mark Horstman studies the very essence of flame itself to find out.
Over the last century, bushfires in Australia have killed more than 550 people. A third of these victims died in just one February weekend in Victoria. Flames 40 metres high that was rolling, rolling red. It looked like a tidal wave. Most people killed by the fires were in their houses. This used to be the centre of a town called Strathewen, and on Black Saturday, two out of three houses were destroyed here, as well as their community centre and even their primary school. And there's quite a few uh, places down into the, the hamlet of Strathewen where people did, did um, uh, die in their homes. For Malcolm Hackett, the memories of that day remain as raw as the landscape. There were spot fires that were spotting in front of the, the main front. It wasn't one fire, it was many fires, and it was different for people in different places. Understanding the physics of how fire spreads is what drives Andrew Sullivan. What we're seeing here is a um, footage taken from a camera that's placed inside a fireproof box that's located inside the experimental plot. His research video shows how Mallee Heath Forest burns faster and more intensely than previously thought. The current system that is used to predict the rate of spread of fires in forest fields under predicts the rate of spread by as much as three times under most conditions. And what kinds of things can allow a fire to spread really rapidly over long distances? Well, the the, the key um, fuel element that does that in a forest like this is the bark on the trees. They can ignite at one end and be lofted into the convection column of a bushfire and actually travel many, many kilometres, up to 30 kilometres downwind of that main fire and start another fire. To test fuels under such extreme conditions, he's built this custom-made lab in Canberra. We can light experiments under conditions which we would normally never be able to study fires. Welcome to the Pyrotron, the only experimental fire tunnel of its kind in the world. Getting a better understanding of the interplay of the flame, the wind and the radiation is one of the key questions in the Pyrotron. We've got about a kilogram of fuel per square metre, which is equivalent to about 10 tonnes per hectare in a forest. These experiments, plus the 2003 experience of the Canberra firestorm, confirm that garden design is crucial for house survival. Now, one kilogram of dry fuel has enough equivalent energy to power a 100-watt light globe for 50 hours, but that goes in, like, 10 seconds in a fire. Understanding that and taking steps to make sure that that isn't next to your house and isn't in the way when you want to get out of your house is critical. What Andrew discovers in the Pyrotron is reflected in the work of Justin Leonard. He's surveyed every major fire involving significant house losses since Ash Wednesday. We've learnt that most houses actually burn down due to ember attack or the effects of ember attack without the fire front even approaching anywhere near those houses. Today, Justin is visiting Malcolm Hackett, who in Strathewen was counting on the protection of 400 metres of grazing pasture between his house and the blazing forest. I've heard about ember attack and for some reason I imagined that the embers would fall out of the sky. I didn't expect that they'd be coming like a sandstorm horizontally at me and that they just keep coming and coming and coming. It takes a gap of no more than three millimetres for a house like Malcolm's to be destroyed by embers catching light in a window frame. That's exactly what Justin sees when he tests construction timbers in front of a gas heater radiating as much heat as a bushfire. You can imagine the heat from the deck is transferred onto the facade. One of the most important features is to um, have uh, non-combustible um, decking materials at least in the last four, uh, 400 millimetres between the deck and the facade. When the scientific survey crew first came to see this house in Strathewen, they couldn't understand how it had survived. Justin has come to see for himself and meet the father and son team who stayed to defend. 
as we came into the main part of the house here, all we could see out through the windows was flames. Little spot fires that were happening around the house and under the house uh, and in the gable. You'd put them out, or you'd think you had, uh, and you'd go back a quarter of an hour later and they were back again. They survived because of their ingenious plan to shroud the walls in a curtain of water. And as Cam recorded on his video camera, covered themselves with protective clothing. <laughs> thought about it a lot and thought, well, it's going to stand up to a, a, a huge amount of heat. So I went for a full copper system and um, sprinkler heads that actually throw out a huge, huge amount of water. If the sprinkler heads are sort of overlapping each other, the wind will take the water over the roof. How much water did you have uh, in reserve for this? I had 70,000 litres ready, and I used about 50,000 litres over the, over the few hours. Under normal circumstances, this would be um, a highly unlikely house to have survived. The owners had extensive planning, a very effective spray system, and the two adults that worked very hard before, during, and after that fire. It was really why this house managed to survive such a, a brutal uh, exposure. But there's something else that protected them as the peak of the fire front destroyed everything around the house. As soon as the radiant heat hit the windows, windows cracked, but, but they held in place, so that's, that was lucky. For Justin, that's a valuable insight. Cam had actually siliconed his plain glass windows into his frames, and what that seemed to do was give it more of an opportunity for the glass to stay inside the frame rather than fall out and allow a rapid ember entry into his house, and that certainly seemed to make a big difference. As Victoria prepares to rebuild, many are asking the obvious question. Why does one house ignite and burn during a bushfire when another one doesn't? Science can only tell you so much. You need to appreciate the complexity of fire physics and chemistry, the fuel load outside your house and the radiant heat. But you also need defence against embers, a long hose, a water supply, good communications, face masks and protective clothing, and a well-prepared defence plan. And in the end, a non-flammable sprinkler system, toughened glass, and even a bit of silicon. Otherwise, you're relying on luck. And in a land of bushfires, you risk being taken by surprise. This is a new state-of-the-art fire truck, recently given to the CFA here at Aries Inlet. It has twin cabins, so there's no firefighters riding on the back anymore, and it can also spray out a protective wall of water. But the advance of firefighting technology is one thing. Firefighting is still primarily a human endeavour. And some of the fireys here would remember well from Ash Wednesday, that sense of adrenaline fueled urgency that a rapidly moving and unpredictable fire front can cause. And there's a problem. Under stressful conditions, sometimes the best decisions are not always made. So, fire services are turning to psychology to better understand the decision-making process when the heat is on. CFA brigades responded to over 1,300 incidents that day. As the day wore on, you're just bombarded with information and you're bouncing things off your key people in the team. This is King Lake National Park, right in the heart of those fires on February 7. This is where the park office used to be. Just down the road from here, many houses burnt and, of course, many lives were lost. Now, on that day, our firefighting systems were really put to the test. And those systems are not only made up of the technologies, the fire trucks, the communications, they're also made up of people. People forced to make a lot of decisions, often in very stressful circumstances. Without doubt, the 7th of February has been the toughest day of my professional life. It was intense. 
points and training, it, it just takes everything from you. You build up this, this sense of momentum and you don't get a chance to spend time reflecting on it. You just get this growing awareness. This is the nightmare we built and it's becoming a reality. Even before this year's catastrophe, the fire services realised they needed to understand the human decision-making process as best as they could to do the best possible job. Well, it turns out the way to do that is to light a virtual fire. Notification, a fire has just started at coordinate 290 100. OK, so I've got to decide what to do. We be, well, we better send... Um, oh, there's houses over here. Gee, that fire's advancing rapidly. I guess we've got to try to um, build some sort of fire break through here and get some fire trucks out. For there. the last seven years, Dr Mary Omidy and her team from La Trobe University have worked with the Bush Fire Cooperative Research Centre to study how firefighters make decisions. When you look at what our brains can do, both in how much information they can keep active... And then you also look at how quickly the brain can work, that is, how quickly it can process information. There's a mismatch. A fire is an incredibly complex issue with lots of things to keep in mind, lots of uncertainty. In this simulation, while the person is fighting a fire, a second, more destructive fire starts. See, I can feel the pressure in this just computer simulation either. The experiment found the more time and resources the person had committed before the second fire started, the more reluctant they were to quickly change their plan. You've built this picture and you've, you've built a solution to the problem that you've got to deal with. You're working on it, you've committed your people, you've briefed them. The challenge to then pull all that back and start again when a fire is moving so quickly, it's very difficult. For the experiment to show the decision-making process with any reality, the person being experimented on needs to know how a fire behaves. High air temperature and low humidity cause fuels to dry out and fires to spread. On February 7, Victoria had its hottest day on record, 48.8 degrees, and extremely low humidity, around 5%, compared to a February average of around 44%. Fire burns quicker if the available fuel is fine, such as grass, small twigs or fibrous bark. Fast grass fires have been recorded moving at 23 kilometres an hour, and a forest fire can reach 12 kilometres per hour. If the wind speeds less than 12 to 15 kilometres an hour, a fire spreads very slowly. But above that threshold, it will start to move very quickly. And when the slope of the land increases, fire speeds escalate. For every 10 degree increase in slope, the fire speed doubles. So if the ground is flat, it might take 60 seconds to burn. For a 10 degree slope, it takes 30 seconds. For 20 degrees, 15 seconds. And for 30 degrees, it takes just seven and a half seconds. It's an exponential increase. Another experiment measured firefighters' ability to make predictions when events changed exponentially. The participants watched a fire burn on flat land for two minutes. They then had to predict where the fire would be in two minutes' time once it had burnt up a 30-degree slope. It might go up to about here. OK. Now let's take a record. The fire burns eight times further on the 30-degree slope than on the flat, and all the firefighters tested underestimated the distance. We're sort of very much thinkers of the present. We're hardwired to sort of think things will keep changing the way they've been changing up to that point. Between 2003 and 2005, firefighters were interviewed immediately after fires to understand their experience of what happened. Listen, fella, don't worry about it. A number of extra factors were identified that were affecting decision-making such as people becoming mentally overloaded. This can lead them to not having the mental space to anticipate future developments or to overestimate their ability to remember important information. To put it into a more cognitive terms, we grossly overestimate our mental capacity. We overestimate the amount of information we can deal with or we overestimate the rate at which we can process information. 
And, and that was a very robust finding. Another factor was people tended to trust information given by sources they knew or had a closer relationship with. When you're looking at a very fast moving fire, lots of information to come in and process, people took longer to accept information from someone they didn't than someone they did. They'd ask a few more questions just to clarify, to confirm. The researchers produced a number of preliminary recommendations to help firefighters make decisions, such as focusing on the fire and not the plan, not relying on intuition in exponentially changing events, not getting mentally overloaded, and establishing relationships with direct contacts at all fires. The worst thing that you can have is, is people on the fire ground being uncertain, hesitating, not making the call when they need to. No decision is always a bad decision. We've got to build confidence, and if they can understand better the decision-making processes that they're going through, then that's a great outcome. You'll find some tips for surviving a bushfire as well as more information on this program on our website, including an extended and very compelling interview with Deputy Chief of the CFA, Jeff Conway. Well, that's it for Catalyst for the Year. Hope you can join us next February for the beginning of Catalyst's 10th year. Happy holiday season and keep safe. Catalyst congratulates Wi-Fi inventor Professor John O'Sullivan for receiving the Prime Minister's Prize for Science. You'll find our recent story about the implications of his remarkable achievement on our website. Bushfires. Prepare. Act. Survive. We now have a national approach to warn you about bushfire danger. There's a fire danger index to tell you how dangerous the fire could be. And a new national bushfire emergency warning system. This has three levels of alerts to help you make the right choices. ABC Local Radio will keep you informed. Find full details at abc.net.au slash emergency. ABC Local Radio, your emergency broadcaster.